Welcome to Brookings. I'm Don Cohn and uh, senior fellow here at Brookings. The germ for these papers was hatched or planted, I guess, or seed, I guess the seed was planted, maybe that's the best metaphor. Uh, in the spring of 2017, David Wessel and I were having a conversation and we thought it was a good time to take stock of what we knew or thought we knew about the efficacy of unconventional monetary policies at central banks that had been used since the central banks hit the zero lower bound in the winter, fall winter of 2008. The asset purchases, strong forward guidance, negative interest rates, et cetera. It was a good time for the U.S. because the U.S. had actually begun normalization of policy, so they were unconventional policies were being phased out. Portfolio additions had stopped, interest rates were rising in the spring of 2017, and uh, the Fed was saying that if rates, when rates got up a little higher, then portfolios would begin to run off. Global growth was good, and that implied that maybe the UK and the ECB and maybe at some point even Japan might be able to stop their unconventional monetary policy. So it was a good time to take stock of what, had, what we had learned in the previous, uh, previous nine years. There were lots of studies of various aspects of unconventional monetary policy with disparate results, and we wondered whether we could find somehow a consensus of what worked and what didn't work and why it worked. So were the policies uh, successful in changing financial conditions in the market? Were the policies, were the financial conditions, how did they affect the economy? Did they boost the economy to achieve inflation and employment goals? And what channels did these things work through? What could we say about the costs and ben the cost side of unconventional monetary policies? seemed pretty evident that the inflation risks that some people worried about when they were being put in place weren't, wasn't a real cost. And the Fed was exiting, so concerns about exit didn't seem to be really high, but we needed to review that. And there are the financial potential financial stability concerns with the unwinding. So what can we say about costs? I think we'll hear today that how effective these policies are and what channels they work through aren't still, aren't yet settled, settled, completely settled issues, but we hope by this project we've moved the discussion along. The conversation with David also occurred in the context of returning from a conference at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco when we were having this converse, the many, the conversation happens many times in the U.S., there's secular stagnation, persistently low interest rates and low equilibrium rates, resulting in concerns about is there enough scope for monetary policy to, after a recessionary shock, to move the economy back to full employment and, and achieve the 2% inflation target. And we thought that uh, before really undertaking an alteration of a well understood and accepted inflation target, maybe we ought to assess whether combined conventional and unconventional policies, especially as those unconventional policies had come to be refined over the slow growth period, would be sufficient to achieve inflation and output objectives in a timely way without changing the basic structure and strategy of policy, changing the 2% inflation target or going to a price level target, et cetera. Now, we had in mind a project or some articles that future policymakers could refer to if ever they were in the same situation we found ourselves in in the fall in December of 2008. To be most useful, these articles should be accessible to interested, informed policymakers who weren't necessarily technically trained economists and also useful to con Congress, people in the Congress, senators and representatives and their staffs who were also interested and informed and who oversee the Fed and help shape public discussions of Fed policy. And that led us to seek the partnership of the Journal of Economic Perspectives, 
These articles will be out shortly in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, and we thank Tim Taylor and the other editors who helped to focus and shape the contributions. We were also struck that much of the literature about unconventional monetary policies originated within the central banks. Uh, that's where most of the expertise on monetary policy is, but the credibility of any resulting, any article that might summarize what we thought we knew or didn't know would be enhanced by having authors not so closely associated with policies or invested in their success. And that led us to Ken Kuttner from Williams College for the assessment of unconventional monetary policy in the U.S. and to a number of people at the IMF, Giovanni della Ruccia, Paolo Robinal, Damiano Sandri of the IMF for unconventional policy in the Euro area, Japan and the UK. Each paper will be presented by the author, author followed by comments from two knowledgeable observers and then a panel discussion and questions from the audience. Ken will present the first paper with comments by Anna Cieslak and Ken West. Louise Shiner of, the, of Hutchins Brookings will moderate the discussion. Damiano will present the second paper with comments by Ben Broadbent and Angel Obidi. Stephanie Kersuru of the Federal Reserve Board will moderate that discussion. Ken, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Don. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks also to the Hutchins Center for organizing uh, this event, which is uh, bound to generate some very interesting discussions uh, this morning. So time is short. I'm going to jump right into the topic, um, unconventional monetary policy in the U.S. So most people here probably already know the overarching goal of unconventional policy in the U.S. was to try to lower long-term interest rates, private sector interest rates, increase the avail availability of intermediate credit, and um, uh, the uh, unconventional policy consisted of really two prongs, as I'm sure you know. The first prong was something I'm calling quantitative easing. When you talk about quantitative easing, we're talking about three asset purchase programs, the LSAPs plus the Maturity Extension Program, or MEP. So my chart here shows, uh, you've probably all seen some version of this chart at some point. This shows the central bank, the Fed's balance sheet, uh, and the thing that I want to bring out from this chart is that the four different policies were rather heterogeneous in their nature. So LSAP 1 and LSAP 3, uh, you see on the chart, involved large increases in the volume of mortgage-backed securities held by the Fed, which is a very novel policy. Uh, LSAP 2, uh, or I should say um, the Maturity Extension Program in particular, involved a huge, a very major substitution from short and inter intermediate-term bonds to longer-term bonds. So, and then the second prong of unconventional policy was forward guidance. Uh, forward guidance, of course, consisted of statements intended to reduce expectations of long-term interest rates, of short-term interest rates, and by doing so, decreased long-term interest rates. Now, it's worth pointing out that the Fed had already been engaging in some kind of a weak form of forward guidance for some years. Uh, so, for example, um, forward guidance was a, a statement from 2006 stated that the committee judges that some further policy firming may be needed to keep the risks of inflation and, and output on track in balance. Well, forward guidance, the forward guidance policy was kind of in the same spirit, but just more concrete in terms of what it said about future interest rates. So, for example, the December 18 statement, 2008, uh, spoke of keeping the funds rate low for some time. They got a little bit more, a little bit bolder in 2009, referring to a low period of very low interest rates for an extended period. Uh, in, beginning in 2011, they went to calendar-based statements, such as uh, exceptionally low levels of interest rate for at least through mid-2013. And then in 2012, uh, they went to a, a very explicit statements about the level of interest rates uh, contingent on economic conditions, so at least uh, as long as the unemployment rate remains above 6.5%. So let me just take a moment to uh, mention what unconventional policy was not. When I talk about unconventional policy, I'm going to exclude things like uh, the alphabet soup of various emergency lending programs, commercial paper funding facility, uh, TAF and all that stuff. I've lost track of all the abbreviations. And it's also quite different from the quantitative easing policy practiced by the Bank of Japan. To recall the difference between what the Fed was doing, what the Bank of Japan doing, was doing, the Bank of Japan was focused primarily on bank reserves, which they like to call current account balances, confusingly, uh, whereas the Federal Reserve was really focused more on the asset side of the balance sheet, emphasizing the quantities 
and the nature, the, the characteristics of the assets being purchased. So did it work? That's the central question here today. Did unconventional policy stimulate spending and speed the recovery? It's actually not an easy question to ask, uh, to answer, which is, I guess, partly the reason why we're here. So the fundamental problem in assessing the impact of unconventional policy, indeed any kind of a policy, is that uh, we really don't observe anything you might think of as a, uh, as, a, as a controlled experiment. So therefore, it's hard to identify a causal effect of these policies. So a skeptic would say, well, gee, uh, you know, interest rates fell after quantitative easing and forward guidance, but maybe they would have fallen anyway, given the weak economy. Or the skeptic might say the economy continued to contract despite quantitative easing and forward guidance. Therefore, the policies were ineffective. Or might even say the economy eventually recovered, but maybe would have done so on its own, even in the absence of these policies. So the trick in terms of uh, identifying the policies is to find some kind of a sort of an exogenous movement of the policy one might use to identify some causal effect, which is very difficult. Some additional complications arise in the context of unconventional policy. Well, first, there's the relatively short track record, about seven years, all told, with which really is not even a full business cycle. To comparis uh, in comparison, when economists look at the impact of conventional policy, they're looking, they're drawing on a four or five decade experience with interest rate policy, and even then, there's still some debate and some uncertainty about the effects of conventional interest rate policy. Second, uh, the quantitative easing, at least, uh, relied on kind of a poorly understood, maybe that's too strong a word, or maybe an under-researched uh, transmission mechanism, <laughs> namely for the portfolio balance effects, which I think are, are, uh, were sort of abandoned as a, as a thing uh, research-wise back in the 1970s, and then they came back into vogue, sort of, uh, and the Fed and other researchers kind of had to reinvent or rediscover that aspect of the transmission mechanism. Third, as mentioned previously, the policies were rather heterogeneous uh, in terms of the asset mix being purchased, the type of assets, uh, and uh, of course, for guidance, nothing like that had really ever happened before. And so it became a challenge for researchers to really come up with a summary measure of the stance of monetary policy, so to speak, that one could then uh, assess the impact of. And then finally, of course, lots of other things were happening at the same time. Of course, lots of other things are always happening at the same time, but uh, this is particularly acute in this point. Economists are always, uh, in order to assess the impacts of any policy, economists are typically looking at how deviations of policy from the normal course of policy would move, or shocks is, uh, in the jargon, would move the economy away from its normal trajectory. Well, things were so different in 20,000, in uh, 2008, that it's really hard to know what normal would have been in that context, and hence hard to know exactly what a shock to monetary policy would have been. Well, so having explained why discerning unconventional policies effects is so difficult, I'll move on to a very brief summary of some of the research that's out there. As Don mentioned, there's been a ton of work uh, in uh, you know, countless papers, more being written every day, so already my uh, survey is, is gonna be a little bit out of date. But I think it's useful to start with something of a taxonomy about the kinds of research that's been done on the topic. So in one bin, I have I put the uh, studies that look at the impact on interest rates. And so this is relatively straightforward to do, although there are some, there are some issues. Uh, the, and there are two kinds of studies that fall into that bin. One are what I call event studies, and the other is what I call econometric term structure models. Another bin of uh, research uh, is uh, studies that look at the effects on the real economy. This is a little bit trickier, or a lot trickier. Uh, and there are two types of research in this category. One would be uh, one would be studies that look at that are sort of macro level. They look at the they look at macro effects, typically using a macro and aggregate macro model. And then there's some interesting research using micro data, micro level studies on the differential differential impact across different firms or banks. So quickly, event studies. A quick summary of what these are and what they have what they have been what they have found. The basic idea of an event study is quite straightforward. Of course, you look at the market's response to the announcements on the day of, or maybe in a very narrow window around the announcement of the uh, around the policy. This, of course, relies on the policy being unanticipated. Because if the policy were anticipated, those effects would have been priced into the yields, priced into the stock prices whatever, and so you wouldn't see an effect even if the policy were actually having an effect on the economy. So what I've shown here in the pink bars are uh, the change in the 10-year treasury rates uh, on various key announcement dates for quantitative easing. These are my calculations, but they're virtually identical to the ones that are out there in the literature. And as you can see, the first uh, section of the chart shows the impact of the LSAP-1 announcements, and as you can see, four of the 
uh, four of the first five announcements uh, resulted in very large negative impacts on the 10-year Treasury yield. In fact, if you add up all the uh, if you add up all those effects, uh, however many there are, you come up to about 100 basis points, a full percentage point reduction in the 10-year Treasury rate. But when, what one sees is the announcements on sub, the announcements associated with subsequent programs are somewhat smaller. Again, this may be because this may be because those uh, those programs are less effective in terms of raising inter, in terms of lowering interest rates, or it may simply be that those policies were more widely anticipated than the announcements associated with the first LSAP. And then another twist in terms of assessing the impact of the quantitative easing policies is that many of this, or at least a few of the quantitative easing announcements came on the same day, the same FOMC, uh, the same FOMC statements as key forward guidance announcements. So it becomes a little bit tricky to disentangle the effects of forward guidance versus quantitative easing. There have been efforts to do so, but I don't have time to summarize those. So a few other caveats having to do with event studies. Uh, one, some of the early LSAPs were associated, uh, were, took place in times of market turbulence. And so high, uh, some of the effects one sees from the first LSAP could have been a result of increase, in improving market functioning. Second, to the extent that the announcements were anticipated, as previously mentioned, uh, the, observed input, the observed responses from the event studies would tend to understate their effects. But at the same time, uh, I think there are real concerns about the event study evidence because they don't really tell us much about the persistence of the effects. Did they dissipate after a few days, after a couple of weeks? We really don't know for sure. And obviously, if they were less persistent, then that would have a smaller macroeconomic impact. Well, another approach involves uh, what I'm calling economic term structure modeling. And uh, OK, this is a you know, pretty complicated, or, but rigorous, and, but rather opaque uh, way of assessing the impact of changes in quantities on the asset prices and, uh, and bond yields. Not enough time to go into that. Uh, but the bottom line is really trying to, trying to affect the impacts of the, prices on quanti uh, the quantities on the prices. And in doing so, imposing some economic structure on the model and uh, separating out the advantages, it separates out the expected interest rate effects from the term structure effects, uh, which uh, allows, the, uh, allows for the separate identification of those portfolio balance effects that I mentioned earlier. And the advantage relative to the event study evidence is it doesn't rely on the markets being surprised. These will work uh, even if markets fully anticipate those announcements. Ballpark estimates for this kind of study come out to be about 40 to 50 basis points for the LSAPs and about 20 basis points for the maturity extension program. Pretty respectable reductions in the interest rate. Mostly, but not entirely, this, is, this came through reductions in the term premium with some marginal effect on expectations. And I have a nice chart here, which I don't have time to show because I'm, I'm running low on time. So we get to the really, uh, I think the important question here is whether unconventional policy had any real effects Measuring the effect on interest rates is relatively straightforward, a bit tricky, but this is much harder. One way to do it involves feeding the interest rate reductions that come out of these other models, particularly the, the term structure models, into a macro model and see what comes out in the other end. A couple of studies that do this have come up with an estimate in the range of about one percentage point on inflation, pretty respectable, with some lag. Uh, there's also a set of studies that use uh, very interesting studies that rely on micro methods, micro data methods. Uh, the insight is that these policies would be expected to affect different firms or different banks differentially, depending on their characteristics, depending on their initial conditions. I'll just mention a couple of sets of studies. Uh, one found that firms with more reliance on long-term debt tended to respond more favorably, tend to be benefited from the maturity extension program, which recall was explicitly designed to reduce long-term interest rates relative to short-term interest rates, relative to those uh, firms that relied more on short-term debt. Good circumstantial evidence in favor of the effects of the maturity extension program. Another uh, trio, I think, of studies, uh, at least, looked at the bank's exposures to mortgage-backed securities and found that those with a greater exposure to mortgage-backed securities tended to benefit more from the first and third LSAPs, which, to recall, were primarily focused on purchases of mortgage-backed mortgage -backed securities. The issue with these micro-based studies is they don't really tell you much about the aggregate effects. They're kind of strong circumstantial evidence that policy has had an effect. It's hard to aggregate them up and say, OK, the bottom line effect on the macroeconomy was whatever. What about costs? What about the unintended consequences? Well, one is Don mentioned is inflation. I think we can really dismiss that out of hand without uh, giving it a second thought. Uh, I think a more serious concern is that the pol these policies resulted in adverse or disruptive spillovers to other economies, particularly to emerging markets. Uh, 
Uh, but a couple of points need to be made here. This is, uh, uh, one is that these are not unique to unconventional policy. These are true of any kind of a, any monetary policy, low interest rate, expansionary or contractionary. I haven't seen any evidence indicating that there's anything unusual about quantitative easing. And secondly, these effects are surely more, certainly preferable to a more protracted US recession, which would have been highly damaging to many other economies. A less easily dismissed concern is the concern about excessive risk taking. Uh, and uh, the, hard, the difficulty here, I think, is defining what constitutes excessive. Uh, during a period of financial crisis, uh, during a period of financial crisis, financial market disruption, you see we saw a lot of flight to quality with investors being very unwilling to take on any kind of a risk. And in that context, a little encouragement to take some additional risk might actually have had some positive effects. Wouldn't be such a bad thing. In any case, an environment of very, an environment uh, of, this is an environment where a little bit of additional risk at a micro level, to the extent that it contributed to economic recovery, would have had a beneficial aggregate effect. So, should the Fed use unconventional policy next time? Well, to summarize, one part of the question is whether it worked. And I think, you know, the evidence is such that it will never really rise to the beyond a reasonable doubt level. Uh, that may be unrealistic to ask, given the limitations in the studies and the, uh, and the short sample period. But I think by the preponderance evidence standards, the answer is clearly yes, at least to some extent. What about the costs? I haven't seen anything that would indicate the costs were major, although there is some legitimate concern about a too low for long uh, environment. But I should point out that this is not specifically a function of unconventional policy, so much as is a function of the Fed's interest rate decisions in recent years. So finally, Bottom line, why not? Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, let me just start by saying this is an excellent summary uh, of UMPs uh, uh, during uh, the crisis and after crisis, and it will become a staple reference certainly for my students. Um, I will comment on uh, something that Ken didn't have much time to talk about, that is the communication of those policies. And in particular, I will ask what is the main piece of news that financial markets gleaned from unconventional monetary policy announcements? So uh, for a while, it has been understood that news coming out at uh, communication events by central banks is not one dimensional. Uh, on top of revealing their actions, policymakers also tell us about the path of their actions. And uh, these are the words that are contained in the statement. So the simple graph is showing you the wordiness of uh, statements released by the Fed, starting from the summer of 2007 through the taper tantrum. They were clearly talking more, or you guys were talking more, and they kept talking <laughs> even more uh, in, uh, 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 in the period uh, from mid-2013. Now, what are these words conveying in terms of news? Uh, so uh, people came up with at least two other channels on top of this being news about monetary policy. It could be news about the fundamental growth expectations, and it could be news that affects risk premium. And this is one of the main challenges, at least for event study uh, types of uh, investigations, uh, to resolve. Okay? Many of the papers that can summarize most of them actually focus on univariate responses of asset prices around communication events. And I will argue that to sort out which type of news came out during communication events, it is actually useful to look at bivariate response of asset prices. And in particular, I will study the co-movement of stocks and yields across the entire <coughs> maturity structure to sort out the question about the types of news. So, when you think about a very simple framework uh, in which you have three structural shocks, a standard conventional monetary policy shock that moves short rate expectations, what it should do is it should induce negative co-movement between stocks and yields, as Ken and Ben Bernanke have documented uh, in their work, and many subsequent, subsequent papers did so as well. 
So you should see negative co-movement upon a monetary shock that weakens with the maturity of the, of the interest rate. In terms of growth and... you use the mic, keep over watching your Oh, that's uh, new to me, but okay. Uh, so in terms of other type of new, types of news, if you have a risk premium shock or growth news being revealed by communication, in general, under relatively simple conditions, they will generate positive co-movement between stocks and yields, but the maturity pattern will be different. Growth news will affect more the short end of the term structure or intermediate range of the term structure matur uh, uh, maturities, and risk premium shock through the duration effects should affect more the long end. So using this very simple intuition from a stylized macrofinance model, in some recent work with Andreas Shrimp of BIS, we propose to classify news coming out at central bank communication events in a four-way matrix by whether the co-movement between stocks and yields is positive or negative and which part of the term structure is moving more. So the two left columns are non-monetary news, being growth news or shocks to risk premium. On the right-hand side, you have a conventional monetary policy shock inducing negative co-movement of stocks and yields, but more so at the short end, and the unconventional monetary policy shock that will move more the long end of the term structure than the short end, negatively with the stock market. So here are some examples of what term structures of realized covariances between stocks and yields look like over time. Let's look at the middle panel. In the middle panel, I am plotting realized covariances in an event window, and each bar is showing you the realized co-movement at high frequency between stocks and yields of different maturity. This looks very much like a, a monetary policy shock where the stocks, uh, where, where there was a negative co-movement, like in Ken's work, but this co-movement declined in maturity, very much like a conventional shock to monetary policy expectations. On the right-hand side, you see an event where actually you see a positive co-movement between stocks and yields that is highest in the intermediate range of maturities and declines with maturity. On that particular event, it seems that the important piece of news was uh, Fed's update to growth expectations. And this seems to be the driving shock here. On the left-hand side, you see actually that these announcements can be multidimensional, at the same time conveying monetary news, moving the short end, and risk premium news, moving the long end and in the positive direction with uh, yields and stocks. We have known uh, that uh, uh, central bank pronouncements can have dramatic effects on asset prices through the risk premium channel, and probably the closest example of this happening is Draghi's whatever it takes speech. The uh, short end of the term structure barely changed, but the long end of the term structure moved dramatically. And in particular, this seems to have been a major risk uh, on event when safe assets, long-term treasury bonds in Germany uh, lost, yields went up, and the stock market and risky assets rallied. Okay? So this would be classified through the lens of the framework that I laid out as a risk premium shock. Now, let's look at co-movement between stocks and yields over time. So I am plotting covariances, realized covariances in a narrow event window uh, between stocks and the five-year yield changes, stock returns and five-year yield changes. And consistent with Bernanke and Kuttner, most of the time, the co-movement is negative. But when you look at the period from the summer of 2007 through the taper tantrum, you see a lot, of, a lot of heterogeneity in terms of signs, suggesting that part of these movements were actually dominated by the non-monetary policy no, uh, component. That is news that didn't just drive short rate expectations, but revealed to the public something about growth or end risk premium. Now, we can zoom in in this graph on just uh, uh, UMP announcements. So uh, three takes away for looking at the co-movement of stocks and yields around particular UMP programs. First observation, before 2013, which is the vertical line in the plot, these policies were dominated by positive co-movement between stocks and yields, suggesting non-monetary policy news content. However, 
If there was a forward guidance component, the co-movement suggested strong monetary news uh, component, okay? Uh, the third observation from the graph is that after Bernanke's taper tantrum in mid-2013, generally policies related to tapering and exit from easy policies were associated with negative co-movements suggestive of dominant news on monitor, uh, do dominant component of monetary shocks. Now, what we obviously want to do uh, is to understand which fraction of variation in asset prices has been dominated by a particular type of news. Uh, so, uh, put it in terms of a simple equation, we observe asset prices, uh, uh, yield changes, stock returns around central bank announcements. We want to convert the information in asset prices into shocks that have structural interpretation to be able to say which type of news contributed what amount to the observed variation in asset prices. This can be done. So using intuition from structural VARs, we can rotate observed variation in asset prices into structural shocks. And I will apply this intuition just to looking at scheduled FOMC announcement within a very narrow window of when the announcement happened. So let's see what the contributions of the different shocks have been over time to yields and stock market returns um, at scheduled announcements. The bottom panel, the, the little table, is showing you which fraction of variance in asset prices stemmed from a particular type of news. So the first line is telling you that the two-year yield moved roughly half and half uh, uh, in response to growth news being revealed, so growth expectations updates being induced by central bank announcement, by Fed announcements, and the other half stands from short rate expectations updates, okay? St standard monetary policy news channel. The second row is telling you that the 10-year yield was dominantly, dominantly moving because of the term premium adjustments. The final row is telling you that, risk, that equities have been moving around because of the uh, discount, risk-free discount rate news. Okay? Now, looking at the trajectories in the upper panels, you see how the contributions of those various shocks have been evolving. So on the left panel, you see that monetary news were pushing two-year yields up, but growth news started pushing two-year yields, uh, uh, were pushing down, but growth news were pushing two-year yields up, uh, starting from around 2013. In terms of equities, what is striking is the very strong effect in terms of increasing uh, equity values, stemming from the risk-free component of the discount rate or expectations thereof, okay? Consistent with the Fed's desire to generate a sort of wealth effects. So let me conclude. Uh, uh, probably most of us would agree that the importance of communication has increased in unconventional monetary policy times. It seems that unconventional announce, uh, policy announcement had an important component of non-monetary news. And we, we have found that this non-monetary news component essentially increasing, increases the more central banks talk. Uh, I would like to leave you with two questions, perhaps for the later discussion. Uh, is what markets heard actually consistent with what the Fed said and wanted the markets to hear? That's the first question. And the second question, a lot of our work has been empirical. The open question to me at least is what is the optimal design of central bank communication in those times? Thank you. Well, thanks. I'm happy to be here. I thought this was a great paper. And like Anna, I will say, well, recommend it to all my students. Recommend it to all of you. It's got great information in it for both uh, insiders and uh, people who are new to the topic. The, um, talking to Ken beforehand, he said he uh, tried to present a fair and balanced view of quantitative easing. I would say that 
in contrast to the use of that phrase, in some corners outside of this room, I think it really was fair and balanced. I am probably towards the skeptical rather than enthusiastic side about uh, the efficacy of the Fed's programs, but uh, I fall within the range of things that, uh, range of views that uh, Ken acknowledged in his talk, in his paper. So what I plan to do uh, is actually, um, Ken was so careful to acknowledge all points of view, I found uh, difficult to find something to disagree with, but I did find two sentences I disagreed with. <laughs> Shockingly, in his 15-minute uh, talk, he didn't have a chance to even bring them up. I don't, don't understand why he couldn't say everything he said in the paper in his 15 minutes. Uh, so let me, let me, let me uh, uh, work my way towards those two sentences of disagreement. So first, uh, a potted summary of, of the paper. Um, he thinks unconventional monetary policy worked, uh, though there's uh, ambiguity about the magnitude and the persistence of its effects. Uh, Ken mentioned persistence in his talk, and I'm going to come back to that, so note the word uh, persistence there. Uh, there's considerable ambiguity as to the extent to which it worked through uh, adjusting relative asset supplies, through portfolio rebalancing, and the extent to which it worked through uh, forward guidance. And he concludes that uh, in any future use of unconventional monetary policy, uh, he should, we should conduct it in a rule-like way. I, I would agree with that. Uh, we should use both forward guidance and asset purchases. I would agree with that. He wishes we were in another world where the Fed could do things it's not allowed to do, uh, uh, perhaps. And finally, the two sentences that I disagree with, uh, as he said, even if we're away from the zero lower bound, uh, why not use unconventional monetary policy along with our usual uh, uh, targeting of short-term interest rates? So uh, I agree, the evidence on uh, quantitative easing is mixed and ambiguous. Uh, I agree it probably had uh, positive effects. Uh, I'll uh, lead you up to explaining why I am towards the skeptical side on uh, unconventional monetary policy. Again, I think it works, but I'm just not as enthusiastic a believer in that view as others. But I'm skeptical enough that I'm uh, doubtful that one should be using it as a monetary policy tool in normal times. All right, so this is a, a graph from a paper that I co-authored with uh, David Greenlaw, Ethan Harris, and Jim Hamilton entitled A Skeptical View of the Impact of the Fed's Balance Sheet. So when you see Exhibit 4.1, it's not 4.1 in the paper under discussion, it's 4.1 in, in my paper. So a two-scale graph, and on the right side, uh, the scale is interest rates, and the line going down there is 10-year uh, yield. Um, the right scale is the uh, amount of Fed secu securities held out right, and you saw that uh, same line in Ken's picture, though he had a nice pretty red color underneath it. And what are the shaded areas? The shaded areas are periods in which the Fed was increasing its holdings of securities outright. Uh, during any of QE1, QE2, QE3. And this is not quite the actual periods of QE1, QE2, QE3. You can see the, see the scale there. Uh, there's an 09, and the shaded area for QE1 starts in 09 because the Fed started purchasing securities in January of 2009. QE1 actually started, uh, you know, end of November, so it's, it's not quite QE1 itself. It's the period of purchases. Um, what I want you to notice there is uh, the 10-year yield was higher at the end of each of these purchase periods than it was at the beginning. So quantitative easing is supposed to say when we bring things onto our balance sheet, uh, interest rates fall. Interest rates did fall uh, overall. Uh, mostly in the periods between quantitative easing, including, by the way, in the period of the maturity extension program, which isn't <coughs> shadowed there. All right, so does this say that uh, uh, buying assets increases our interest rates? Well, of course not. We, well, we, I always think I'm talking to a room full of professors. We professors, you know, spend a lifetime saying correlation isn't causation, so uh, this graph does not mean when the Fed buys assets it drove up interest rates, self-evidently. Uh, and in a particular context of, uh, of uh, quantitative easing, uh, I mean, I've mixed here purchases of uh, mortgage-backed securities, agency debt, and uh, treasury debt. 
Um, you know, so a lot of things going on here, but I, I would ask you to keep in mind when you have uh, thinking about the, Fed, the success of the Fed's programs to bear in mind at the end of the purchase periods for QE1, QE2, and QE3, 10 year yields were higher at the beginning, at the end, <laughs> than they were at the beginning. So, as Ken said, uh, you know, we've got to figure out some way to, to you know, identify something causal. Uh, the, the, um, I'm going to talk about the effect on 10-year years. I'm going to talk about one of the two things that Ken mentioned, the uh, event studies. Um, as a preliminary to that, uh, there is a little bit of stuff that Ken didn't talk about, um, uh, uh, which has to do with regression studies. Uh, my reading of that literature, as, uh, like Ken's, is there's little persistence from uh, Fed actions. Um, so I'll just put that on the record um, and then talk about the event studies. I want to say that event study evidence should be interpreted cautiously uh, that uh, when we get this 100 basis point effect, for example, in QE1 that Ken mentioned, which as he said is, is standard, uh, it's not quite clear that those 100 basis points is a meaningful 100 basis points in the sense of persistence of the effects. Um, and I'm not sure I'll be able to get to the second bullet point, uh, but perhaps. All right, so first of all, uh, unambiguously, this announcement, the event study literature, announcement effects, uh, they identify an effect on 10-year yields. So I am not going to dispute that. Unambiguously, unambiguously, unambiguously. The, the March 2009 announcement extending QE1 uh, within 30 minutes of the Fed announcements, 10-year yields fell 44 basis points. There's nothing else that could have made him fall. Of course, it was the Fed announcement. Of course, of course, of course, no doubt about that. However, if we think the way, mon the way monetary policy works is uh, the, the central bank lowers interest rates you know, uh, on government lending or influences them that, that lowers private lending rates, that stimulates the economy, we would want any impact on interest rates to be persistent and sustained. Um, this particular one was not per so persistent and sustained. Uh, the pointer seems not to work, but the uh, you know, some of the jig jags you see in that uh, rising 10-year yields during QE1 are uh, you know, these numbers I have on the, on the overhead. So one explanation for this is, uh, yeah, absent the Fed doing this, uh, uh, everything that followed would have been, you know, 44 basis points higher. Another possibility is maybe the event study literature uh, despite its uh, good intentions, doesn't quite uh, capture the sustained impact of uh, an announcement like this. So my example here uh, actually comes from this Wolfers and uh, Zitzowitz uh, AER paper, which Jim Hamilton also used in, in a comment on uh, quantitative easing, is step out of of monetary policy, take the election in 2016. After it became apparent that uh, Trump was going to win, equity futures fell 5%, which is a big amount, by the way. Standard deviation of movement on the stock market is about 1% on a daily basis. By noon, that had all come back. Now, an event study uh, over a narrow window would say Trump caused the stock, uh, Trump's election caused the stock market to fall by, by 5%. What happened between the election and noon the next day? Kind of nothing. I mean, the market was digesting the news, I would say. Similarly, with the uh, Fed, you know, 50 basis point uh, effect there on March 18th, arguably what happened was the Fed digested the news, uh, sorry, the market digested the news. In the end, interest rates were essentially back where they were started from. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to have to skip most of this. Uh, Don Cohn said uh, we're not doing quantitative easing anymore. I thought the Fed was doing quantitative diseasing. They're selling off their securities. So. If you think there's this uh, um, portfolio balance effect, it should still be uh, still be working its way along. It doesn't seem to affect the markets. I mean, people are kind of ignoring what's going on. Um, all right, uh, so let me end here. Uh, uh, I think uh, unconventional monetary policy worked. I'm not sure it worked as effectively as, as some people argue. Um, so I would say if you're the zero lower bound, by all means use it. Uh, but if not, uh, stay away from it. We really know how things work with the short-term interest rate. Let's stick with that and stay away from quantitative easing when you're away from the zero lower bound.
you all for like really, really interesting and uh, informative presentations. Um, I'm sure that we have a lot to talk about. Let me start with um, kind of where you were, Ken, at the end, which is just asking this questions about event studies and, and w w how to think about using something like an event study to figure out whether something like QE works. Is it a little funny to know that the central bankers who are doing QE aren't sure if it works and they look to the stock market to decide, especially at the beginning of something new? Like, why, why is it that they understand better than we do whether or not QE is going to work for the economy? Um, anybody? Like, Which can was that addressed to? Oh, well, I was saying I was starting with the stock market and the Trump effect, just in, but, but why, don't you start, why don't you start by answering that question? Um, and I'm interested in anybody's comments. Let's see. So there's a little yeah, the little mouse. The little mouse. Yeah. Oh, little mouth. That's okay. Great. <laughs> All right. So I've got the little mouth on here, I think, and uh, the red light means uh, that. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Great. Uh, no, that's an interesting point, um, uh, uh, Louise, and I think you. It's a. It's good that you bring that up. And this is a time that, you know, um, I wasn't there at the Fed. I had left the Fed long before. But it is a kind of an awkward situation where you're, as you say, looking to the markets to determine whether the policy is effective. But I think the, you know, the, the uh, I think Anna's uh, presentation uh, was spot on in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I'm perfectly, I'm perfectly happy to agree with Anna's point that the markets are able to kind of figure out what these effects are gonna be on the, on, uh, on yields um, with the caveat that this is something, one of the issues with the policies is that um, these are really things that had never been seen before and so, the markets are figuring it out just like just like the Fed was figuring it out. Um, I would like to add to this uh, that um, we have uh, growing evidence that tells us that markets respond not just to what we would believe is a traditional monetary shock, but also some other information that is revealed by central banks, and. I think the empirical evidence on this is pretty strong. Uh, now, the mechanism that underlies it, I, I do think is uh, we are still a little bit in the dark about. Uh, when I talk to Fed people, they tell me that th they are adamant that they don't actually have more information about the economy than the private sector does. So what is that the Fed is releasing uh, to the public some different information uh, that actually makes the public update their expectations about the economic outlook is, I think, an interesting question. Let me just jump in uh, I, after that. That was, um, I think what Anna's referring to is the difference that some people, the distinction people have some, uh, some have made between Delphic and Odyssean forward guidance. You didn't mention those terms in your presentation, but that's exactly what you're talking about. Uh, and the, I actually did have one more slide, which I didn't get a chance to. <laughs> and the final bullet point in my last slide actually had, uh, play, uh, ties in quite nicely to what you said, which is, uh, the communication strategy for this kind of policy becomes really critically important, and I'm not sure exactly how to do it. Uh, and I, I agree with you, there were some announcements, and I think, you know, um, uh, Justiano, Justiano and Evans, that pa you know the one I'm talking, and the, it was a Brookings paper, so you all know it, uh, very legitimately made the point that there were these information effects. Um, so the communications that one would have to, the communication that one would have to um, craft to accompany that, to convince the markets that the, the Fed wasn't, you know, by conducting expansionary policy, wasn't telling the markets that things were actually worse than people thought, that's, that's a tough challenge. I think that's going to be a challenge. In, uh, but it's not to say that's a challenge unique to unconventional monetary policy. I think it's a challenge for any, uh, any uh, Fed uh, policy communication strategy. Let's talk a little bit more about the question of persistence. Right, because that seems to be sort of the, so, so everybody agrees that on the day, there was obviously, there was a reaction, right, by the markets, that we know. So that's the empirical evidence quite clear. They were reacting, and they thought they were hearing something. Um, how, and how do you feel about the evidence that shows that these things weren't necessarily that persistent? And I guess I was thinking it was just the event study, but you said also the term premium regression stuff also shows lack of persistence. Um, Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing I did in the process of uh, preparing this paper was I also came in, as I hope you can tell, with kind of a skeptical viewpoint. And one of the things I did was to say, well, 
Uh, I did some of my own regression analysis to try to figure out, well, how much of these uh, can, if we look at a longer window, or if we look at a period of time not just measured in, in one day or two days, but over like a, even a week, I did find that a couple of the, that some of these announcements actually did have highly persistent effects, and they could measure them at a, even a, as long as two weeks. Again, I think one of the, uh, a couple of those announcements were the really big reactions associated with the first LSAP. And you might say, well, okay, so the really persistent effects there may have been traceable to things other than uh, the reduction in the term premium, the restoration of market functioning, or whatever. But I think some of these things, some of these things are so huge. I mean, uh, uh, comparable to the 5% uh, drop in the stock market. And they didn't recover right away. They, some of these effects you can see uh, over a period measured in, you know, as following as 10 days. That doesn't mean they're, you know, at, at that point, the problem, uh, Ken, as you know, is you lengthen the window, and a lot, of, a lot of the news comes in. And so it's like, well, okay, it goes away after a couple of weeks. Is that because the market is you know, overreacted and it's coming back? Or is this because a lot of other stuff is happening that's going to, uh, that's going to mess things up? And you know, that's the nature of event studies. You can't really, it's a trade-off between event window, uh, you know, shorter event window, you, um, uh, you can get some of these overreactions. A longer event window, you can get uh, other stuff going on that's kind of messing up, your, uh, messing up the results. So it's a trade-off, um, and you know, I think that's, uh, as I said, that's one of the inherent limitations of the event study method. So it's a couple of weeks a long time? <laughs> It's long, it's long enough that you can't, you can't ascribe it to a market overreaction, a day of market overreaction, as in the, as in the Trump effect. Um, so uh, I think the distinction in terms of persistence is uh, closely linked to whether it was the term premium that moved or short rate expectations that moved. And uh, it is true probably that all the effects that went through the term premium are not particularly persistent because uh, term premium rever mean revert relatively quickly. Uh, however, we know that short rate expectations are incredibly persistent. So uh, when the Fed, uh, if the fable, Fed is able to move short rate expectations, I would expect these effects to have a lot, uh, these uh, announcements to have a larger uh, and more persistent effect. So when we think about what, what you just said in terms of forward guidance versus asset purchases, is that, is that like, we would we all agree that forward guidance is that changes the market expectations of short rates works, right? Um, and the question is much more on these asset purchases. Is that the right way to think about it? So that the asset, yeah. And therefore the asset purchases, we, which are sort of intended to move the term premium are less likely to be persistent. Is that kind of what you're, you're saying? Um, how do you bring in the evidence, the micro evidence? That's sort of a different way of looking at it now, you know, about certain firms or certain households and how they were affected. Does that kind of, kind of is that have a lot of weight in your, in your view that Kiwi worked, a little weight? And Ken, what do you think about that in light of your skepticism? Yeah, well, you're the skeptical one. <laughs> and I'll well, I think, go this way. <laughs> so I, I think uh, so I have a very traditional view of the way monetary policy works, which is, uh, you know, it, it, it lowers monetary policy and wants to expand the economy, uh, works by lowering nominal rates. Uh, prices move slowly, so that lowers real rates. Falling real rates encourage spending. So I think the first step in the transmission, uh, if the first step doesn't seem to be working, uh, one should be skeptical about the ultimate final, out, uh, final steps of that working, and uh, kind of the, the burden of proof is higher. So I'm skeptical about this first step working very well. I think it worked somewhat, again. I mean, I'm not, not saying it didn't work, but I'm, I'm less enthusiastic, I think, than Ken, for example. So if I'm a little skeptical about the first step, that makes me uh, you know, a little more skeptical, all things equal, about the evidence uh, about it working at the final step. Uh, yeah, no, I think uh, you, you make a good point, Ken. Uh, the one uh, set of studies I was referring to, which I thought was actually uh, quite nice, uh, by some people at the board, uh, was didn't really rely as much on the interest rate channel as it did on what you might call the bank lending channel. And that's the one that said, well, you have some banks that have higher exposure to mortgage-backed securities, and so if you can take some of those mortgage-backed securities, which were, you know, which were a little bit iffy or perceived to be iffy at the time, if you take those off the balance sheets, then that could increase uh, uh, lending through by making uh, 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 even apart from any effects it might, be, might, might have had on the interest rate. So, you know, we didn't, part of, I think part of, the, part of the issue with the literature on this is that it's been so focused on the interest rate 
uh, that it's tended to ignore some of the other channels of transmission, particularly through the financial system and through intermediation, which I think can't be discounted. Okay, so obviously figuring out the effects of QE and unconventional monetary policy is incredibly difficult looking back to see whether or not it worked and what the counterfactual would have been. Now let's look forward a little bit. So you ended your slide with like, why not? Which is hardly a vote of confidence. Um, <laughs> so, so looking forward, I think you, know, you, you read the literature and there are some people who think, look, we, you don't have to worry about the zero lower bound at all. We have these other tools. These other tools are just as, as effective. We can translate them by scaling them up. We can kind of get any, any effect that we want and no worries about you know, low R star and having to change the framework because we have tools. Uh, what do you think? Uh, let's, well, each of you, so why don't you start, Ken Kuttner. Oh, why don't I start? Uh, yeah, let's see. Well, Ken characterized my, uh, my conclusion, which I didn't really have a time, time to get to, as enthusiastic. I wouldn't say I was terribly, I wouldn't say maybe enthusiasm was an overstatement. I think the, the experience opens up some possibilities that are worth considering. So, for example, using balance sheet policy independent of interest rate policy, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that, uh, I, I think that's, I mean, the standard uh, academic dodge is to say more research is necessary, but in this case, I think it's absolutely true. I think we have to think about what are the, what are the situations, for example, in which, in which that might be an appropriate kind of a policy to make. I think the, uh, my reading evidence is that that kind of policy would be possible. Whether it be advisable depends on uh, what, whether there was a well-defined objective, for example, a financial stability objective that uh, that kind of policy would further. Uh, in a non-zero bound, in a, in referring to the non-zero lower bound environment, uh, in a zero lower bound, in, in a zero lower bound environment, I'm uh, going to uh, echo something that Don has uh, has said uh, on a number of occasions to me, and, and that is. You know, essentially, when you're talking about lowering interest rates, you're talking about uh, sort of moving expenditure forward in time. And there may be some limits to how much that can be done. And so the interest rate effects, I think, might be somewhat more limited than, uh, I'm not sure how far we can push those, but uh, clearly we're able to push them farther than, uh, you know, uh, maybe farther than a skeptic would have expected going into it. Does, I'm just ask a question. So this question about moving consumption forward, is that something specific to unconventional monetary policy, or that's just a question about any interest rate effect? I think that's the question about really any interest rate fact, uh, effect. Uh, that's true. Uh, but it, the, to the extent that the scope for that is, becomes a little bit more limited when you're talking about unconventional policy, then I think it would be, become more binding. Okay. Yeah, Anna. So uh, uh, going forward, I, I guess I uh, personally have two questions. So uh, one question, we have spent a lot of time thinking about international spillovers on emerging economies and so on. But um, the general question is how, how did those policies affect market functioning, even in very liquid markets in the US treasuries and so on? What, what were the effects? I am not sure. Uh, I don't have an understanding uh, uh, of an answer to this question. That's, that's my first uh, question going forward. The second question is about inflation. Uh, so you end your paper saying inflation has uh, certainly not been a worry. Uh, and I think this is true when inflation, uh, when it's essentially inflation driven by demand shocks and there is no trend inflation, bonds are very risky, we don't need to worry about inflation. But if we start to have persistent updates in inflation expectations, uh, then, then we might get all uh, issues related to the pricing of treasury bonds and financing of deficits and so on. So Forth. So the question is, will we have any persistent uh, shocks to trend inflation going forward? Well, I said I thought there were two cents in Ken's paper. I disagree with. Maybe I misread him. Uh, maybe we don't, don't disagree at all. Uh, I thought you said you were supportive of using uh, you know, LSAPs in normal times, but now it's saying maybe not. Um, so I think in zero lower bound situation, absolutely, uh, you know, LSAP. So I, my view is once we're away from there, uh, no. Uh, I, we understand or we think we understand how uh, um, monetary policy transmission works when uh, the Fed is controlling a short-term interest rate. Uh, I think we're kind of very uncertain about how monetary policy works when we're using LSAPs. So I would say away from the zero lower bound, stay away. <laughs> 
we're getting at. So, are, you know, are we ready for the next recession? Should we think that we actually need to do something else besides thinking, well, we've got LSAPs in our back pocket, so we're okay? Do we, is this like, should we worry enough that we need to change the monetary policy framework, raise the inflation target? How much confidence does the experience with the unconventional monetary policy give you um, that says we're, we're going to be okay? Um, sure, you, yeah. Uh, I would, I think if we could avoid the zero lower bound, it would be great. Uh, whether that comes with some sort of price level targeting, raising the inflation target, I don't know. But uh, I think uh, I think we're all aware um, interest rate cuts usually add up to three or four percent traditionally when we're going into a recession. Uh, we're not even at the three percent, and let alone the four percent level. So the next recession, we could end up back at the ZLB, and I think it would be great if we could avoid doing that. No disagreement for me on that, Ken. <laughs> you know, I, I, maybe the wrong, maybe a future conference would be one dedicated to raising the inflation target. That's a that's a that opens up a whole other set of issues. But yeah, obviously, um, you know, the, to the extent that we want to keep uh, as far away from the zero lower bound as as possible, subject to other other policy considerations. Great. Okay, I'm going to open up to the audience for questions. Uh, if you raise your hands, if you have a question. We have mics coming around. Uh, do we have mics come up? Here, come up for. All right, and uh, tell us who you are, please, and where you're from. I know Hi, you, Bill I, English, Bill <laughs> University. Uh, so I wanted to follow up on the persistence question. I guess I took some comfort from the kind of uh, regression results and yield curve results like Lee and Wei in thinking they, they were showing persistent effects. Ken, expressed, Ken West suggested uh, some suspicion, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. And, uh, and, and let's say we, can, we, we convinced ourselves persistence was a real problem. Well, can't the central bank then just peg out the yield curve? I mean, the, the Bank of Japan is pegging the 10-year JGB yield. So, so maybe it's, it's a change in the way you do this, but not necessarily something that's, that's terminal for that sort of policy. The paper you mentioned I can't comment on. I don't remember it well enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we should worry about persistence, pegging the 10-year yield, uh, possibly, I guess. So I'm going to punt on that. <laughs> uh, thank you for taking my question. I'm just a member of the public, but it seemed to me in 2008, 2007, or whenever it was that quantitative easing was announced, the fear was runaway inflation would ensue. And yet it never has ensued. So... Um, one, I'm wondering what will happen, but doesn't this just tell us that really all these economic theories that you had going into 2002 are wrong? <laughs> well, that's kind of a big question. Um, <laughs> uh, well, the, the, uh, the impact, I think the, at least the consensus thinking nowadays is that the main driver of inflation is going to be sort of the, the level of slack in the economy and the degree of excess capacity. And to that extent, I, you know, I think don't, no one would gainsay the point that uh, in 2008, 2009, into a relatively recent period of time, there was, very little, there was a lot of slack in the economy. Uh, and even though, um, even though the Fed had injected a lot of you know, monetary base, uh, the slack was keeping uh, downward pressure on the price level. Uh, so I, that's conventional wisdom that I'm perfectly happy to accept. I think in that context, maybe the, the puzzle is, and this pertains to Japan too, is why inflation actually didn't fall more. Because there was so much slack in the economy. Uh, take Japan, for example, very prolonged recession, only very, uh, only a very small amount of deflation. So if there is, if there is gonna be a puzzle, I'd say the puzzle's in the opposite direction. Thank you, Roberto Perle, Cornish the Macro. Um, so, so far we talked about the efficacy of these programs in the aggregate in their totality, right? But is there um, any evidence in your mind that uh, the efficacy may have changed over time? Uh, maybe changes with the level of the balance sheet, with the uh, level of interest rates? Uh, seems to, an important question to, uh, if we want to address uh, the, the prospective eff efficacy of these programs. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the... Uh, great question. I wish we knew the answer. The problem is it's hard enough to discern just the overall effect of unconventional monetary policy to slice that more thinly and say, was it more effective during these three years versus the th these three years? That's asking a lot of the data. I just don't think we have enough information to be able to address that in a serious way. <laughs> 
question actually for Anna. So, so when you're looking at what the information was conveyed over time, does that tell you anything? I mean, so if, if, you know, at some point, if let's say part of the information is that people know the Fed's reaction function, once they know it, is that kind of, uh, are, are you sort of done? Or is that always something that you can continue doing? Uh, right. So I, I think the problem is um, with identifying the strength of the effects over time is that indeed markets learned about the reaction function and then event studies do not resolve the issue uh, of uh, whether the subsequent programs were more or less uh, effective. Um, just because we are looking at those narrow window where probably all the expectations were already adjusted. Um, now, in terms of uh, what, what we have found, at least, is that uh, through the period of the financial crisis, it is clear that uh, communication by most uh, big central banks like BOE, uh, ECB, and the Fed were dominated by non-monetary news content and starting from the tightening, uh, in the tightening period, starting from around 2013, it was strong monetary uh, content. So, um, I, but I cannot comment on the, on the strength over time because it's an event study evidence. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.